Welcome everyone. My name is Maureen Antunes, president of the Vancouver ACM SIGGRAPH chapter. Welcome to this very special conversation for Spark FX. We're very excited to have with us Mr. Jason Hayes, a renowned musician and composer, um, award-winning musician and composer. <laughs> And, and we're going to be talking to Jason a little bit about his career and his time working in video games, which is mostly what you're known for, but not the only thing that you're known for. So thank you so much for making the time to join us today. It's really my pleasure. Thanks for asking me on. It's awesome. So I wanted to start by finding out a little bit about you. Like you grew up in New Orleans, which is a, a city that's known for its music and culture and food and all kinds of things. But was music always something that you were like really into and that you knew you wanted to do? Yeah, at a pretty early age, we moved away from New Orleans and we went to, um, but, you know, I mean, I've been in Louisiana, like, you know, a lot of my family has lived in Lafayette, Louisiana, and I've got family in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and of course, family in New Orleans also. So, I mean, I love Louisiana culture. It's something that's a big part of me, although it doesn't look as much a part of me as most my family. I don't have the, I don't have the accent like my family does. I don't look quite as um you know a little little different but still i love the food and it's 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 part of me so you know as far as music being part of my life it, that wasn't until i was gosh i was uh i was a young i was still a boy i was pretty young it was um we had moved to houston texas and i had an interest in my neighbor's piano i would bang on the piano because i didn't know what i was doing but I was fascinated with the piano. I just thought it was really, really cool and really fun to, to play around on it. And I did that all the time. And uh, that was my earliest memory of being involved with music. And so were piano lessons like a natural extension of that or? Well, at first, I mean, I had banged on the piano so much that the neighbors offered, they said, you know what? They talked to my parents and said, you know, Jason seems to really like our piano. So we're going to go ahead and let you guys have an extended um, rental. We'll, we'll move the piano to your house and, and you can use it. And it was very sweet of them, but it was also a way to get me out of their house, being on the piano all the time. So um, I, I basically had, I had the borrowed piano and the piano lessons came within a few months. They, they realized we should do something about this. So I ended up having piano lessons then. Uh, with uh, Janet and she was a wonderful teacher and I only had her for a year and a half and she moved away to New Jersey so um, my piano lessons were pretty short-lived which was a disappointment because I was enjoying it very much but uh, I wouldn't come back to actual formal piano lessons till I was in college that's really that's when I started back I mean I played by ear like with everything that I could absorb from the lessons I played you know piano all throughout but I was never um, trained except that year and a half until I got to college. Wow. So, you know, you see, you take piano lessons for a year and a half. Do you think I'm going to be a musician at this point? Or, I mean, you're still so young. Like, what, what are you even thinking? Yeah, you know, I was basically, I was super, super um, into the piano. I was really into trying to figure out things by ear on the piano. And so... Um, I would basically pick up things by ear and, and try to play them. And I mean, I don't have a lot of vivid memories when I was a kid, for whatever reason. I, I don't have uh, a, a great recollection of lots of things, but there's certain things I remember very clearly. And one was that, you know, I was, I was obviously so into the piano um, that one day my father surprised me with a keyboard, with a gift of a keyboard. And, you know, he had asked me, you know, it was like a surprise. He said, can you get my umbrella out of the car, you know? And I'm like, sure, dad. So I go out to the car and certainly like in the car was this keyboard. And it, I remember that vividly because it was such a, uh, a lightning bolt moment. It's like, oh my goodness, I have my own keyboard. So um, I spent just hours and hours and hours uh, on that keyboard as a kid uh, trying to figure out everything I could about, about how to make sound with it. So when did you make the, the, like the formal decision to be like a musician? Well, I was basically, you know, I went in high school, I played trombone. I, 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 I played some, a little bit of jazz piano in high school, but I wasn't serious about it. 
And I mean, look, by the time I started thinking about what I was going to do as, a, as a, an adult, a young adult going into college, I thought I'd have to do like a respectable career. I thought, you know, um, it may be, I thought computer science or computer engineering. And I tried both of those things for a very brief period of time, but I was so interested in music. And uh, eventually I just succumbed to that. And I just went after music because um, I just, I just, I spent so much time in the music hall kind of pining away wanting to do it. And so finally I just gave in and I went for it uh, without a real clear, you know, vision of how I would actually make that work uh, as a, as a career, but, but I love music. And, and so, yeah, that's, that's when I decided really in earnest when I was, uh, when I started college. So were your parents worried? My dad was extremely worried. Um, you know, it's like, it was a situation where my dad had a talk with me, he sat me down and he said, you know, Jason, uh, you have such a talent, you know, uh, at piano. If I had your talent, I would just, I would, I would probably like really enjoy, I can imagine myself in a hotel lobby or maybe at a, at a, at a like, and, and I'd play piano. Maybe I would get some tips, you know, and I would entertain. And it was wonderful. It would be a wonderful thing I would do on the side of my main career, you know? Uh, and so it's all a roundabout way of making the point. It's like, you know, but really, you want to find something you can do, you can make a living at. And so he was trying to tell me gently that, you know, like, I love that you're a musician, but you need to get serious about doing something you can actually make a living with. And so it was a very loving thing to do. He was wanting to, he was worried about me. And so he had that talk with me. And so, yeah, I tried other things before music, um, but none of them stuck. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you, you studied music at the University of South Texas, right? So North you graduate. Texas. Well, what, what are you doing now? So you graduate with this music degree. What's the next step for Jason? So, okay, so basically, you know, it's interesting because I never actually graduated. Uh, I went to school for music at University of North Texas. And it's an amazing music school. It's really like wonderful school. And I enjoyed it thoroughly, especially the music theory classes where you learn about the nuts and bolts of music works. So I was enjoying it very much. But I got an opportunity to go on a tour, on a, on a national tour, on a tour bus with an Atlantic recording artist. Uh, to play in that band. And um, it was just too irresistible to pass up. I dropped out of college to go on that tour right before finals. And so like, even though I was doing well in school, that semester I got like a 0.4 GPA. It was really, really sad. I mean, I, it was like, I didn't just like, I didn't just mess up the semester. I did it with like spectacular style. You know, and so my dad was very, very sad about it because I was, I was on board to, um, you know, to, I was, I just had an incredible, incredible run I was doing in school, but, uh, but I left to go on tour. So anyway, it was, a, it was a great experience and uh, we were not paid very well. I'm, I'm not ashamed to say it was just, you know, but it was, it was still, it was, it was incredible to go on tour and, and live on the tour bus. Uh, so, yeah. So, okay. So you don't actually graduate. You go on this, you know, North American tour. So ne then what? So then, okay. So after that, I thought, you know what? I'm going to try to get involved. Um, I really wanted to do uh, movie scoring. I wanted to write music for movies, but, you know, I, I was back in Louisiana and I didn't know how I would do it, but I thought, you know, I, I need to move to California. That's kind of, maybe like a lot of the cent the center of that activity. And so that's what I thought I would do. Uh, but then one day I just had this lightning bolt, incredible thought. I was like, wait a second, what about video games? You know, it's got to be easier to get involved with video games than to do major motion pictures or a big hit TV show. I mean, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's a situation where I thought, you know, I like video games and it just seemed like a really a good idea uh and 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 more than that it just seemed like it was like a really cool feeling it's like oh my goodness this is what i should be doing so um i went after video games and um at the time i think it probably was easier to get involved in the video game industry than than major motion pictures um it wasn't effortless it was definitely a challenge but but now it's really like it's become a really hot field 
And so I have a lot of men and women and video and, and, and composers that will contact me and say, man, how do I get involved with video games? That's like the hot thing. And so I feel very lucky to be involved in what's considered to be the hot thing because um, it's become uh, very, very hot and competitive. So, um, so yeah, no, I feel very fortunate to be involved uh, making music or video games. So I'm curious about, let's put this in the picture, the, the, the big picture of the video game industry as a whole. So what year would this have been about? Would it have been like the early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s? About 1996, when I got hired by Sierra Online, which was basically a really big deal game company back in the day, um, but um, they had made all these adventure games like, you know, King's Quest and Space Quest, and, and, and they were known for that. And I loved adventure games, and I still do. I love games with a strong storyline. And so I was really excited to contact Sierra and try to get, get to work for them. And I was, I was fortunate to be hired by Sierra in about 1996 and uh and that's how i started and i was there for about a year and then um we started seeing a situation where the writing was on the wall a little bit with the adventure games in sierra because they started getting away from from the thing that really made them beloved and, and i knew them for was the video games but they were trying to chase after the trends that were popular and they were seeing you know the adventure game as being maybe not as viable. So they were, they were trying to do something different. And so that was a concern because, I mean, besides the fact that I just felt lucky to have a job at all and be making money as a musician, it was also the thing that led me to them that, that made me really uh, passionate about working for them is that I loved their adventure games. So, um, but that wasn't going to, to last too long because, you know, I had left before it ha had happened, but they ended up kind of, um, folding or closing down the studio and stuff so it was the end of an era uh for for basically for sierra online uh so i was just on the tail end um while they were still while they were still around uh but uh, i i really feel so grateful for being you know start making my start at sierra and i think it's funny you know we don't it, it's difficult to imagine that we're a lot of the folks that might be watching this, you know, we have a lot of students in the audience and many of them are born like after the year 2000. So talking about something like 1996 or 97 feels like completely foreign. And I remember the games I was playing back then. And it was basically like, I was a big, I loved Unreal. It was like the thing I played all the time. I don't know why. I've never really been much into shooters, but I really liked that game. And I remember I used to listen to the Doom soundtrack like on replay. I don't know why, it was just this thing that I liked. But video game music was not something that was really like in the back of my mind all the time. And then I remember my partner had brought home, I think it was a PlayStation 2. <laughs> and at some point, no, it must've been an Xbox because he brought home Halo. And I remember thinking, oh, well, this is different. This sounds like this sounds different. Um, and so it, it kind of started to mark like a new, a new era of not only video games, but the way they look and also the way they sound. And you were kind of like at the forefront of that. Can you talk a little bit about how you ended up at Blizzard? Because that was like a big deal, right? Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, getting hired at Sierra was a huge deal. Uh, and then, you know, basically... When I saw the writing on the wall of being like a little concerned about Sierra and where it was going, even though I'd only been there a year, I was encouraged to go to the Game Developers Conference, but it wasn't the Game Developers Conference at the time. It was the Computer Game Developers Conference, CGDC. And, um, and I went there at the behest of my friend, Victor, that said, you should go there because you, know, you should just kind of see what it's about. And so I went there and I went on my own and uh, didn't know anyone, but I brought a a CD player, a, a, a Sony CD Walkman. You know, people used to listen to music on CDs <laughs> back in the day. And um, so I had a portable CD player and I loaded it up with some of my music. And I basically uh, went around and walked up to strangers and asked them uh, if they wanted to listen to some music. You know, hi, my name is Jason Hayes. Uh, would you be willing to listen to a little of my music? And so I put these headphones on on a lot of strangers and i had some really nice reception by people and everything like you know one of the guys i met i remember to this day was bill brown very talented composer uh who i'd met i didn't know anything about him but he was there promoting a game called pitfall and um he was there 
I think maybe it was with Activision at the time, but I'm not sure. Um, but he'd written music for that. And I, I met him and I said, hey, my name is Jason Hayes. Would you be willing to listen, listen to music? And, uh, and I didn't know it, him at all, but he said, sure. So he put on the headphones and, you know, he listened and he said, oh, that's a lovely theme. And I, I remember that was so cool to have, you know, professional uh, working in the industry make a nice comment about my music. So that was really touching. And so I had some great experiences on that trip. And uh, I ended up basically meeting someone uh, from Blizzard, Matt Householder, the name of the guy. He'd worked for Blizzard North, who you know made the Diablo game originally at, at Blizzard. And so I met him on that trip. And uh, eventually I got to make contact with Glenn Stafford, who is basically, he was the one guy at Blizzard who did sound design and he directed voice actors and he's a composer very versatile multi-talented guy and and the only guy there and i i ended up meeting glenn and uh eventually i got uh, an interview with glenn and i got to uh to basically move from uh sierra to to go to blizzard and uh it was great being the number second guy at the company and, and audio and everything and I only had a background in in music really I didn't have anything with sound design or anything with voice acting but I'd learned so much from Glenn and and I, I did a lot of sound design with him and I worked with a lot of voice actors actually a lot of, of coaching voice actors as well in the studio which is something I really actually love to this day uh, so much working on you know with with talented actors in the studio crafting uh, the performances for voice and so yeah i mean it was lucky getting hired at sierra but boy it was ridiculously uh lottery ticket lucky uh getting hired by blizzard it was like the hottest game company on the planet pretty much and so uh, that was an, an awesome thing and so when did you start working on what would eventually become uh, world of warcraft well, I mean, I was at Blizzard for a long time. The first game I worked on there was the original StarCraft that mm -hmm. shipped in 1998. And so that was the first game I worked on. And, um, you know, it's interesting because for that game, I got to not only uh, work on music, uh, but I also did a lot of sound design and I, I helped coach voice actors and even did some voices in the game. So there's a character called the Firebat and that was me. And um, there's some other things like the probe or, you know, other, other units that I gave voice to. But I worked on many games at Blizzard, right, uh, all throughout that time period uh, in those worlds of Warcraft. You know, they had, when I started there, they had, they had uh, you know, so I was working on, say, Warcraft 3 and the Warcraft 3, the expansion. And then, of course, there's the Starcraft and the Diablo game, uh, which was, at the time, the one I worked on was Diablo 2. And so at some point we were deciding what to make next. And there was a good long time when I was working on a brand new title that wasn't related to Warcraft, Starcraft or Diablo. It was this, this really interesting title we were, we were building with some fantastic art, but we were going on for a while and it just wasn't quite coming together. You know, it's some things about it were, weren't, solidifying and so someone had the idea it's like you know we should just we should just make you know like a big online game you know we should do like world of warcraft or something and that wasn't completely a popular idea with everyone it's like oh come on you know we're gonna do another warcraft game you know it's like people want to do something different you know something unusual and uh, uh you know because the game we were building was going to be a big kind of a online kind of a thing and so at first, some people were like, oh, let's not do this. But uh, it turned out to be a really good idea, <laughs> like a really good idea. And, um, and so, yeah, eventually we settled on World of Warcraft. And so WoW was uh, settled on. And uh, boy, that was a, a, really, a really brilliant idea from, from the ones that uh, got behind it. So I, I'm curious, because clearly um, you're involved with the, the process, like right from the beginning. So can we talk a little bit about the process of creation and how that, that works for you? Do you come on, like when you were working on something like StarCraft or Warcraft or Diablo 2, wh whichever project you were on, did you come in, like clearly you were at Blizzard, so you were kind of privy to the entire design process. Do you come in like right at the beginning when things are just starting to develop? Do you start to do like sound cues? Like how does that 
how do the the your how do you start participating in that development process? Yeah, I'm a huge fan of being involved as early as possible. I mean, you know, it's 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 you can be involved in helping to shape a game in a way that you can't be if you're just a, a post production coming in at the end. I mean, the only disadvantage about it is that if you start working on something and certain things just change direction, then you might have to like rethink what you did or redo things that you did. And, and that can happen. But look, I mean, if you're there as a, as a full-time member of the team and they're paying you to be there, it's like, well, I, I don't mind. I, mean, I can do several versions of something if it's, we, you know, we, we end up changing directions. So, um, so, you know, with World of Warcraft, it was interesting because at an early point, there was no game to play. Uh, but there was some wonderful concept art being drawn. Mm -hmm. And so I would write music to concept art. And, uh, and I had done something for, you know, a forest area uh, that someone had drawn this beautiful forest. And so I wrote music to that. And, you know, it ends up being that, you know, it was basically a picture that was being drawn to this area called Elwyn Forest, which is a part of one of the starting zones in World of Warcraft. And so when they actually first made it to where you could actually go in and walk around in this game that was not released yet, but still the early development process, it was so cool to like walk around in the area. And it looks a lot like that concept art piece, but, but it kind of brought to life. And so, you know, to, to place my music in that, in that zone and hear it, uh, it was an awesome thing. It's like, wow, check it out. It's like, you know, it's starting to come together. So, that was a that was a great a great thing those those first moments, but um but yeah that's you know just part of being involved early you know it was it was a good thing to to be involved with all those early decisions as things are formed. Um, so you know you're talking a little bit about how sometimes you have almost nothing to work with in this case you know just a piece of concept art. So how do you how do you start like writing? What's your writing process like? Do you you know just bang things out? Do you you know write music? Do you try different instruments? Do you do you use instruments? Do you do everything digitally? Like what does that process look like for you? So you know a lot of what I've gotten involved with in those especially in those early days, I got involved a lot with the cinematics department. So the guys that make the guys and gals that make the short animated films that either promote the games um, for marketing or they reward the player for progress through the game. And so working on those cinematics was, was an, a, an interesting experience because I'd sit down with the main director and we'd meet and talk about the storyline. And so I would do this uh, in this meeting and you know, when, when I went to a meeting like that, usually there was some kind of an animatic. It's a very, very rough version of the thing. And, you know, these things are not really great to look at because they're, they're not detailed. Some of them can be extremely primitive looking. It's just kind of like a very rough, um, imagine drawing with stick figures. It's kind of like that, but with animation. So you've got these big blocky shapes and they say, oh, that's this character or that's this whatever. And so I'm getting the explanation from the director about what it's going to be. But I find that extremely inspiring because, you know, I'm getting an idea what that story is. And a lot of times I would have to basically just excuse myself out of the meeting for a second. So just, just one second. And I'd walk out of the room and I would hum some ideas into a, into a portable voice recorder because, you know, I thought of something that based on what he said, and I've definitely learned over the years, it's like, you need to record those ideas when you have them. Because, you know, if you don't, the most obvious, simple idea, if you wait five minutes and you don't record it, it can be gone. And, you know, and you just can't get it back. And, uh, and so, yeah, to avoid that, I always, I always carry, I always would carry a, a voice recorder around with me. And so it was a little micro cassette player I had for a while. Now I use my iPhone and I use the voice recorder. And so... I'd come back in the meeting and say, oh, I'm sorry about that. I just wanted to jot down this idea. But, you know, it's interesting because I've had ideas that I've recorded on the spot at meetings like that that have actually made their way into the final. Like, you know, I, I, I've thought of ideas for, for kind of snippets of melody or themes that end up making their way into the actual final thing because, uh, you know, you get that, that inspiration from, you know, the story or a character. And uh, that's, uh, that's, that's a good thing to, to capture. Um, 
you know, when we think about a musical score for like a film or a TV series, it's, you know, a, a given length. Like sometimes it might be a little bit longer than whatever you're watching, but, you know, you can kind of expect it's going to be like two hours long, let's say. A video game can take hours and hours, weeks, months to finish <laughs> playing. How much music, how much sound are you creating for one project? Well, it's very different depending on, on the game, right? I mean... For World of Warcraft, the total amount of music was around two hours. And um, I didn't write all of the music. Um, I wrote a good amount of it. I was the only one of the project for a while. And then we had some other guys contribute some things as well. But, um, but you know, two hours seems like very little compared to now. I mean, World of Warcraft, with all the expansions, it's now up over probably 50 or 60 hours of music in that game. And um, it's just, uh, you know, at some point, there was a decision to just, do new music for every expansion and sometimes a lot of it and so um you know i'm grateful because certain themes and melodies have stuck around and being used as signature themes for the franchise and so i've been fortunate to have certain you know certain themes and melodies be used and even ones that maybe i wrote originally but then another composer will pick up and do something with so you know i've had people contact me uh that, that said oh you know i did this new music uh, for this zone, I took your your theme for this character, Arthas, and I went ahead and I did this new thing with it. And so now there's this new piece of music that's partially based on the Arthas theme. And, you know, I get the vicarious collaboration uh, where I didn't work directly on it, but yet I got to, to work with this person and kind of, uh, you know, so I've had a lot of experiences like that with various composers that have, that have touched the uh, World of Warcraft. So that's a really neat thing. And I'm grateful actually for the fact that there's a desire to have a certain amount of continuity where you have the thematic, uh, you know, continuity where certain themes can be used in various ways that, that will remind you of a character, a situation or, or part of the world. So. I know you also do films and commercials and I, I'm curious if the, the process of creation and, you know, when you're thinking about uh, the music that you're making, if that changes depending on the type of project you're working on. I'm specifically thinking about something like, you know, when you're working on a video game, the music sometimes will have to change depending on, you know, the decision that's made by the character, or maybe they die or whatever. Like, it, it, it seems to me like creating music that could just abruptly end somewhere feels very... It feels like it might be different than something that has like a life where, you know, it plays for 30 seconds or it plays for a minute. Yeah, I mean, it's it's inherently a different experience, interactive, you know, entertainment. It's And, and I haven't really worked a lot in, in film at, at all, although I have done some things like, you know, I mean, like one of the first things I did was like, you know, jingles for the radio, like you hit a radio jingle, a little small song that, uh, so I did some of those and I've done a little work on short films and things, but um, but I've, I've not been in earnest involved in the film industry, uh, but it is a very different experience doing something linear versus you're doing an interactive situation. But I'm always quick to point out that, you know, at the end of the day, really, if you're making music for something, you want to just have hopefully good, evocative, interesting, you know, music that can help to, to, to help the viewer or the player feel something and that's the same whether it's for a movie tv show video game or whatever so in that way it's exactly the same but yeah the open-ended nature you talk about is definitely uh, a situation you have to deal with where it's like well a lot of times you don't know how long someone's going to be say in a certain room or, or in an area so you know that eventually this thing is going to happen but you don't know exactly it's when it's going to happen in the movie you know exactly but in the game it's like well it might happen after two minutes uh, it might happen, you know, after five minutes. And what if they leave the room and they make themselves a sandwich, you know? And it's like, okay, <laughs> it's like, well, you can't have it continue this. So yeah, it, it, it's definitely a challenge. But a lot of that time, you you really hope for the help of your programmers. Like the programmers can help. Like I can envision some really cool way to make it work in an interactive scheme in the game. But I kind of need the help of a programmer or programmers to help bring that that idea to fruition because um, a lot of this stuff will involve the actual code of the programming of the game. And um, it's difficult because the programmers have a lot of time. They have, they, their time is taken up with things that are seen as 
vitally important, right, to the game. And, you know, certainly I think the music and the sound is extremely important. And I think it is. But at the same time, you know, the game working, you know, and the graphics engine being in good shape. These things are also like extremely important and and are seen as a hyper higher priority thing. So a lot of times it can be hard to get the time with the programmers to actually make your dreams as a composer uh, come true. Um, there have been some really good developments in you know recent years now with middleware solutions like there's the WaveWorks interactive sound engine, the uh, Wise, a uh, middleware, and Wise plugs into your game and it gives you a composer or a sound designer a lot of control of how things play and when they play, and it doesn't require the intervention of a programmer at every step because the power kind of is in your hands. So it's really a good thing for for composers to be able to kind of like work under the hood in that in that wise middleware solution and develop a whole interactive scheme that doesn't require a lot of programmer intervention. Uh, you're going to still need someone to help hook things up, but that's been a, a, a big shift that's been really good for, for being able to like work on on basically how things function in the game. And, and really with, with video games, it's like the way things play and when they play musically is just as important as the music itself. I mean, I've heard some really wonderful musical ideas that play kind of at the wrong time and in the wrong situation, and it can really fall flat and not be effective. And so how things play uh, is, is crucial to it working well. So I like to be in there as much as I can. I, I don't think it's appreciated how big of a part, you know, a role like yours plays in, uh, you know, the creation of a video game. Like you, we kind of think of the music as like, you know, you might love it, but I don't think people really realize how integral it is to the, like the, the creation process. Um, what, like over the years that you've been in the industry, how else has that creation process changed? You talk about this new tool that you're using. How else has, have things improved or maybe gotten worse? I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, I don't know what the whole reason is. It's maybe a holdover from like the earliest, earliest days of interactive entertainment where it's like, all you could do is have Pong with the beep across the screen, you know? And that's all you could get, right? So I don't know what it is, but it's definitely been sometimes considered a little bit, almost an afterthought. You know, it's a post-production thing sometimes, but part of the issue is just inherent in what it is. I mean, if I'm doing my job right, hopefully someone really feels something. You know, they feel scared, or they feel energized, or they feel whatever the emotion is. And you don't want the people to be thinking about oh, it's the music that's doing this. You know, it's like if people come away with this wonderful experience where they're moved emotionally, then hopefully, you know, the music has done its role, it's, has done its job. But, um, but you know, one thing that's really brought a lot of focus to that has been uh, people that love video games. I mean, it's incredible the amount of, um, the amount of tension that's paid to, to the music and the games. It's like, you know, it's, 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 it's an awesome thing to see that people get really passionate about the games that they play. And so if you're lucky enough to be involved as a composer in that experience, it's, it's, really, it's really fortunate to be part of that uh, with them, you know? They've had a concert series that's very successfully gone all over the world called Video Games Live. And they play video games with the symphony orchestra and a choir. And they have, you know, screens on the big backdrop where they show footage from the games. And it's an awesome experience because you get all these people that are super passionate about the games they play. And, you know, it's a celebration of the entire industry, you know, not just the music, but, but the music is something that helps bring people together for that. And uh, I think it's wonderful. Plus, it's, it's bringing a whole new audience into concerts, you know, with a symphony orchestra which, you know, maybe they're not going to see the masterworks. You're not going to see a, a Beethoven symphony, although that is an, an awesome experience. But, you know, this is a way to get people engaged with, with the arts in a way that maybe that they, that they, they wouldn't be otherwise. So I think it's a good thing all the way around. Did you ever foresee that 
you know, when you started in the video game industry that we will end up where we are today, where video games are like a central part of, you know, the cultural discussion, you know, music from video games, visuals from video games, video games in general, like it's such a big thing. And like you say, there is like a real passion for not just music, but for like every single aspect of gaming culture. Like, it seems like everything has been amplified. Did you ever foresee that? Is it scary? Yeah, the only thing that the only thing that I really had a strong feeling about when I first experienced it was virtual reality. And I thought, oh my goodness, like I I just love that immersive feeling of it. But you know, the thing is, it's yet still has not quite become the ubiquitous thing that I think it could be because there's issues, you know, the, the nausea and everything else. But uh, I remember feeling like, oh, this is definitely like an exciting look at the future of what you know, the, the immersive experience of a, of a, of a game can be. Um, and maybe, I think it will be eventually, maybe, but uh, they got to solve some problems. But, you know, augmented reality, I think is super exciting. You know, the idea that you can take the game type of experience and the interaction and you can bring it even outside of the world of, you know, just the entertainment product, you can, you can, you can teach. And there's all kinds of ways that you can actually engage with this in, in a way that's not just strictly for for games, but um, you know, it's a popular idea the idea of, of gamifying all kinds of experiences, and I think it's an exciting thing. But uh, you know, answer to your question, no, I haven't. I mean, really, like I said, I had the one little insight when I thought that virtual reality was something really a glimpse into what can be in the future. But uh, I'm just, you know, along for the ride. You know, just excited to see what happens at every turn. And there are so many changes and things going on with the game industry and technology that you can't even, you know, keep up with it. It's, uh, but it's an exciting time for sure. I think it's funny. At some point you mentioned that you were lucky to get in at Blizzard when you did, but I don't know if it's luck as much as, you know, um, maybe charisma, like, I don't know, some, some, some confluence, because you've also worked on, like, another one of the biggest games of the, <laughs> in the universe, League of Legends, so, I mean, I don't, I think it's unfair to credit it to, you know, right place, right time. Dude, I, I love that, and, you know, I will take the winning power of charisma, I mean, I'm not, I'm gonna, that's gonna stick with me, I really appreciate that, no, I mean, I was very fortunate to work on League of Legends, but my role in that was, at Riot, I was music director, which is very different um, from, you know, I was managing a team of composers. They would have liked me to write music um, for the games uh, or, you know, they're doing various things behind the scenes uh, and for League of Legends. And I would have liked to do it as well, but there was no time. I mean, I was so busy, not just with the management thing, but also I was dealing with a lot of um, legal contractual things a lot of things involved with um budgeting and so it was a very it was it was a very not that creative role for me i mean they would have liked me to be there like i said being creative but there wasn't really time to do that because i was just wearing these hats related to management and and these things so that's an incredible company um and i really enjoyed my time there but i never wrote a single note of music for league of legends and and so yeah i i definitely don't, don't claim that although you know i was definitely involved uh you know definitely during some important things in league but uh, but yeah it's um you know it, it's an interesting thing but you know look like i said the, the these games it's like you know i spent some time at valve corporation and i worked on uh, dota 2 there and counter-strike global offensive and I mean, these games are, are huge games. And so I've been very fortunate to be involved with some kind of juggernaut titles. And um, it's, uh, it's an honor to work on, on these games that just have tremendous audiences and, and really big, uh, huge player bases. Would you do more of the management role again, or do you prefer the creative roles? Well, I'll put it this way. I've discovered that I think I have a knack for the management role. I enjoy people so much. I'm a really social person and I would like to do that. And I think I'll continue to do it in some capacity, but I don't think I'll ever do something that makes it not possible for me to be involved in a creative role. So I, I think, you know, create creative first because it, it, it just fills my, my soul, but um but I enjoy the management parts and other things like that too. So I wouldn't run from that 
type of responsibility, but I definitely, I'm, I'm definitely wanting to be creative um, always if I can be. Um, can we talk a little bit about critical hit, which is such a great concept? And oh, such a great, great idea. idea. Go ahead. Oh, it's awesome. Yeah, well, so, absolutely. So let's start. Like, where did the idea for this come from? Okay, so I got approached by, uh, it was backstage at a concert for Video Games Live. I got approached by a guy who was there. Uh, his name's Michael Gluck. And uh, Michael Gluck, um, it was interesting because I met him backstage. And it turns out that he's a piano player. He plays piano. And he had filled in on piano at Video Games Live. Uh, but it wasn't his, he wasn't the regular piano player. And so we met backstage and we became fast friends. It was just like, it was just this instant connection. And uh, I don't know, maybe we're both Pisces. He's, his birthday is March 8th and mine is March 9th yesterday. So um, maybe there's something to that. But, you know, he had this idea that we should start a band together and we should do like all video game composers. You know, so you mentioned Halo earlier, and uh, which is terrific music. And and the guy, the two guys who are at music for Halo are Marty O'Donnell and Mike Salvatore. And so I'm, I'm friends with all those guys. And so, oh, I'm going to call on Marty and Mike and some other people. And so we had this brief flirtation with the video game composer band. And, and we realized no one has time ever to get together to practice. It's like, how are we gonna get everyone in the same room at the same time? It's kind of impossible. So we morphed the idea. And so Michael and I decided we would make a band with outstanding musicians playing all video game music. And we'd have one, you know, the token game composer uh, heading it up. So that was me. <laughs> so I got to do that. But you know, honestly, I got to, I, I get to be like the weak, the weakest link in my own band, because basically, I went after the most incredible musicians I could find. Uh, many of these musicians have played on, on the video games uh, that I've worked on. And so we've got like wonderful players that, um, and so this phenomenal group, uh, we go out and we play at various conventions and things. And we have a blast playing all video game music, not just my music. We do some of that, but we also do music from the entire industry. So, you know, we, we do a very rousing rendition of Angry Birds that, that you know, it's like, it was like, <laughs> and it's, I think it's terrific. I even heard from Ari, who's the composer for Angry Birds. And he said, I really like your version of your Angry Birds theme. It's really terrific. So um, it's fun to be able to kind of do music for the entire industry and with really fun, energetic versions that show off the, the, the talent of our players. It's just, you know, we have these wonderful players. So I love going, going to these shows and just, uh, you know, showing them off because they're terrific. I love that um, you know the music has taken on a life of its own. You know, there's the band. You you you're like the the guy, but I mean, there are other artists that are also doing this, that are creating. You know, that are taking the music and doing their own thing with it. You mentioned, you know, sometimes you get notes about how something that you created has spawned something else. Um, and and also like Spotify and like Apple Music and all of these music services have made the music so accessible that now they've taken on like another life because they're inspiring other things other than just video games. Like I was listening to the StarCraft soundtrack before we got together and, and that was like, oh, I remember this, but it's kind of like this, it, there's a different way to interact with that now, which I think is so fascinating, so amazing. Um, I, will, I wanted to ask you now about, you know, what you're up to now. Uh, can we talk a little bit about your work at uh, Imaginary? What, 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 is, what is Imaginary up to? Yeah, so Imaginary is a brand new studio, and we are so excited. I mean, like, uh, the guy who heads it up that I, I met is, is Wei Wang, and he's a ridiculously visionary, talented artist. I mean, I've been lucky to work with lots of outstanding artists. I mean, at Blizzard and... And, and beyond, and a lot of great artists. Uh, but this guy, Wei, is really special. He's, he's just, he's done some really signature pieces uh, for, for Blizzard, uh, as a principal artist at Blizzard. And so he's starting this studio, and um, I spoke to him about it, and I was very delighted to discover that he was just as excited uh, to talk with me about my interest. And so it was really really wonderful that he was excited about about that and so a lot of mutual respect there and so we've got 
a, a really wonderful team that's forming. We've got a lot of people from the video game industry, but we have some people also from the film industry, um, some, some really talented people. And, um, you know, we are going to be building some stuff that is impossible to talk about because that's the game industry. It's just crazy because you're always scared that, you know, if you say anything that you're going to get a whole, like a bunch of lawyers descending on parachutes and they're going to come arrest you or something. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> so I've learned to be very tight lipped and we're very early days, but I think it's really exciting what we're building in imaginary studios. And I think it's going to be incredible. So uh, I can't wait for us to be able to share more about that. Is it exciting to be sort of in a ground level of something? Because is this the first time that you've come in kind of like a, at the beginning of a studio? Yeah, you know, I, it's, it's normally not the case for me. I've had that, have that experience once before, uh, but it's been a while since I've had it and I'm excited about it because there is something, there's something wonderful about being part of a team right from the beginning and helping develop the, the culture and, and really kind of, you know, the, the whole idea of what you're going to be and, and how you're going to uh, how you're going to build it is it's it's great to be involved at that early stage and so yeah I feel very fortunate for that and you know it, it's some great people to do it with too so you know uh, I think that there's a really special thing about the time when you're a small team you know I don't know how small we're going to be or how 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 long we'll stay small uh, that's something that I don't know for sure but but, you know, right now with it being small, there's something really rewarding about that for sure. And uh, you can do things very nimbly when you're small also. You know, I remember at Blizzard, when I first started at Blizzard, it was a radically smaller company than it is now. I mean, it's just night and day, seismic shift and difference. And there's something with the small team that, that is, a, is a really wonderful experience. So I think for, you know, for a, a company, whether it be I'm the one I'm, I'm part of now or just any company, there's something desirable about keeping a certain small team feel, however you need to do it, right? Uh, because there's, it's, there's a wonderful energy that happens that's hard to maintain with this giant, giant team. But, uh, but you know, some companies do it successfully, but uh, it's, it's definitely a tricky thing. Is it difficult when you have, uh, you know, I mean, I don't know exactly when, I think Imaginary started in January of 2021, which was basically middle of a pandemic. What, is it difficult to not, I mean, I, I'm assuming that you guys might not be back in the office yet. Like, is it difficult to work like remotely? We're all remote, but the thing is, part of the remote nature of it is that you know, we're, we're getting ready and preparing a space where we'll be going to. So, um, you know, we're at that stage, where we're still kind of getting everything ready. And so part of the remote thing is just uh, the fact that it's that we're setting all that up. But also, like you said, when things start in the middle of a pandemic, that's a, a definitely a complication. Um, I don't know what's going to happen in terms of our eventual decision about it, but there's something valuable about having the flexibility that you know, remotes become such a normalized part of the experience now. And like I said, I don't know where we're going to end up in that spectrum, but but it's kind of interesting how the world has changed to embrace some new ideas about how you approach work. And some of those things might just stay that way for good. You know, I don't, I really don't know. But it's interesting to contemplate what's going to happen and which things in the pandemic will be lasting. And we'll just change our lives, you know, forever. I, and I don't know what that is or not, but uh, it's interesting to contemplate that. Does it make your creative, pro does it change the way you approach your creative process or the way that you create music? Well, I definitely, like I mentioned before, I'm a very social person. So I get a lot of energy around people. I enjoy interacting with people. And I also, I find myself like a trip for my own personal wiring for inspiration is to not be too caught up in trying to do something too serious and earnest. Like I really get a lot out of doing something. Uh, that's where I, I, you know, good talks with people that, that can be an energizing thing. I know something like with my, with, you know, I have, I have uh, three daughters and so I'll do things like I'll play piano sometimes and, you know, they'll all dance. And so, you know, and we have a, a blast just having fun that way. 
And sometimes I come up with these ideas that, you know, I'm just improvising and I might, I might play something. I'm like, oh, I want to record that because I want to keep it for later on because maybe I'll use it somewhere. And, you know, if I can make it like playing, then I find myself a lot more liberated, created, creatively. And I'm not, not putting pressure on myself to try to do something, you know, that's going to be good or, or work out well or whatever. It's just if I can just make it about just having fun, it allows me to kind of tap into a lot more freer creativity. So I definitely, you know, try to find ways that I can say that I can stay very much um, just having fun with music and, and being free with it in a way that that helps me to 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 be more creative. Do you have like a hard drive in your basement that's like full of unused <laughs> ideas? You know, I definitely have. Uh, recordings, lots of recordings of myself singing badly. And uh, some of those are as yet unused. And, you know, maybe they will get, I have pulled things out that I thought of like a while back. I'm like, oh, I can use that here. And and so it's definitely not something I want to play. Like, I don't want to make them available to people. It's not really, really ready for mass consumption because it's embarrassing. I don't have a great singing voice. And so basically it's not the kind of thing I want to share with the world, but to remind myself what I was thinking, it's definitely a good thing. So I definitely have lots of recordings of stuff that I sometimes will, uh, will go through to try to find uh, an idea. So the next big hit might come from Jason's hard drive. That's it. right. That's right. That, that's definitely possible. Oh, thank you so much. It's been so lovely speaking with you. Congratulations on your career, all of the amazing work you, that you've done, and the amazing work that you're going to be doing. We're really excited to see what Imaginary has up their sleeves and what you've got up your sleeve. Uh, thanks so much, Marina. This has really been fun, and I appreciate you asking me on, especially, you know, since it's a little bit different than, than the normal things that you cover. And so I feel very, very uh, grateful to be asked on. So thank you. Thank you so much.